134 bruised and aching bodies leave Argel Gazos for the cruel Pyrenean stage to Pamplona in Spain. The Tour de France has found a new king. Now he must command over the giants of the southern mountain chain. Yesterday, Bjorn Arise surveyed his subjects on the climb to Otakam. As the leaders faced the 13 kilometers mounting to the finish, Rees showed his audacious strength and dropped back. He surveyed their faces one by one. After assuring himself that what he saw was only weakness and pain, he left them to pedal gloriously to victory in his leader's yellow jersey. Overall, Rees now leads not by seconds, but by minutes from Abraham Olano of Spain and Tony Rominger of Switzerland. Evgeny Berzin of Russia lost a further 2 minutes 59 seconds yesterday and is now down to 6th. Miguel Indurain tried to play a part 2 but instead faded and is now over 7 minutes back. Chris Boardman climbed a place and he's now a top 30 rider. And unthinkable at the start of this year's tour but it's the way of life in this great event. Miguel Indurain after winning for the last 5 years now races towards his home village without the leader's yellow jersey. The route is a vicious one. The longest of the race at 262 kilometers, there are three first category mountains and one all category climb to come. It carries the field into Spain. For some, it will take them eight hours. And as the race heads towards Pamplona, Gary Imlac is already out and about in the city. Well, Phil, there were quite a few people out and about in Pamplona last night. Riot police and Basque separatists who laid on a few Molotov cocktails for the arriving Tour de France guests along with a small fire in the street and a four and a half kilo bomb which was diffused before it could go off. Much to the relief of the majority of the population of Pamplona, who usually like their mayhem a bit more tourist friendly. For those with ball byproduct for brains and a need to prove their manhood, Pamplona is the place to be in July for the running of the bulls. The festival of San Fermin this year produced no fatalities, except of course for the bulls eventually when they got to the ring. Just the usual mixture of locals and tourists demonstrating the effects of the usual mixture of sangria and stupidity. The patron saint of gratuitous machismo, Ernest Hemingway, who popularized Sam Fermin through his novel The Sun Also Rises, has been honored by Pamplona with a street and a statue named after him. Today, though, all the attention will be on a more local hero. Miguel Indurain was born just a few kilometers from today's finish, and the route goes past his mum and dad's doorstep. Despite the fact that he won't be riding by in the yellow jersey, the locals have done him proud, with banners and a mini grandstand for all his well wishes. Mind you, as the official drink of the tour, I don't think Coke will be too thrilled about the catering arrangements. Well, needless to say, there'll be no spare seats out here by the time the man himself arrives, although since they'd like to see a bit more of him than a five-second flash of teeth, it's thought that most of the family will be heading five and a half kilometers that way to the finish line, where at least there'll be a spot of shade. Back to the racing on the road now, here's Phil and Paul. Well, thanks, Gary, and the action today on the Coldo Beast, which came after 28 and a half kilometres. A little bit of a surprise, this. Neil Stevens, the non-climber from Australia, going over the top of the climb, and his gap 10 seconds ahead of Pascal Hervé and Micheli Bartley. These two riders going clear on the climb, Stevens jumping away from them. Richard Varenk, fourth place for him, but two minutes, 11 seconds behind, and as usual, alongside Varenk, the yellow jersey of Bjorn Aris. Lower down the slopes of the Coldo Bisca for Chris Boardman today, losing a little bit of ground to the men making the action, but this indeed a big test day for Chris. Well, the big heat on the road to the Tour de France to get today with temperatures exceeding 35 degrees Celsius. And in the late afternoon, a slight wind from the east, about 20 kilometers an hour should cool the riders a little bit. And having also gone over the top of the Col de Marie Blanc at 63 kilometers, here's the result of the Col de Sude. Neil Stevens is still there. But this time, only 12 seconds now ahead of Richard Varenk, Bjorn Arise, and quite a large group of riders. But just look at this. Going over the top in quite a big bunch, Miguel Indurain, now two minutes and four seconds behind Stevens. And the group of Evgeny Berzin, well, that came over the top, a massive six minutes and 33 seconds behind. And on the descent of the Sude, what the organisers did not want to see on the Tour de France today, and this on French roads, by the way, we're not into Spain yet, demonstrators slowing down and bringing to a stop the leader on the road, Neil Stevens, who was only a few seconds ahead of the chase group. And as a result of that stoppage, Neil Stevens joined by the other men in the lead in today's stage of the Tour de France.
And now, as we continue the climb here of this very, very difficult Port de Loro, it takes the riders up to the 155 kilometer point and more than 100 kilometers still to race. This is the select group. Gone has Neil Stevens. He's been dropped now. So too Mikula Bartoli, who was in that long breakaway with him early on. Udo Boltz has been dropped too for the telecom team. Rolf Sorensen, Maurizio Fondriest. They've all fallen back to a group being led by Tony Rominger. But they are still minutes behind. This is the lead group, and we could well be looking at the top riders on the overall classification in the next couple of days. Richard Varenk on the right. Alongside him, Jan Ulrich. This boy never tires as he just keeps the pace up there. And Bjorn Aris, the yellow jersey, well, he's already said, and we're going back a week, Paul, uh, that in fact Jan Ulrich is a star for the future. I think he's a star right now. Definitely, he's been a great rider through this year's Tour de France, selflessly working for his team leader, Bjorn Aris. But many people said that the stage in the Alps was going to be the hardest one in this year's Tour de France, the one with the Iseron and the Galibier, which was cancelled. But the way things are working out today in the heat on this year's Tour de France, and this stage particularly, I think makes this one of the toughest days. But here, we're just looking at the face of the man who started a lot of the action today, Pascal Hervé, winner of a big mountain stage in the Tour du Pont this year, a beach mountain. He takes a chance to look over and see just exactly who is in this group. One of his teammates on the left-hand side there, you can see Laurent Brochard, but a whole gaggle of the Mappé GB team. Well, Mappé, who should have been the really the demonstrative team in this year's race, carrying all of their players, the only team left with everybody in the race, and yet they haven't played it well enough. Alano has cracked, and it looks, you know, just two days ago, we were talking of Alano now to be the man the team should uh, go right behind. And yet these last two days, we've seen Tony Rominger suffer, but climb his way back into the race, because as the stage goes on further, it does seem that Rominger gets to feel that bit better. I suppose that's the stamina in a man who is now 35 years of age. And there you can see the slopes from our helicopter, the best way to watch any stage of the Tour de France. No further news coming in from out on the course, but there's no doubt either that all of the big names that we have come to know so regularly in the Tour de France are losing again big time today, with the exception of the overall leaderboard. We have here first, fourth, fifth, seventh, eighth and ninth in this breakaway. Here's the sign for the riders. They'll know now that they are three minutes 40 ahead of the Indurain group, which will put him out to 11 minutes almost behind the overall leader by the end of the day. And there's still an awful long way to go here. The offer of a drink, but the riders not wanting to take it at all, so they get a shower instead. Ugrimov looked to run down the spectator there and swung back into the line. Leblanc on his inside. And sitting at the back and not looking so well today is the rider for Carrera, Peter Lutzenberger. He's not really on the form he's had the last couple of days. And bear in mind that he's had a very heavy season this year and he came out of the Tour of Switzerland, which he raced very hard to win there and, and just held on with the final time trial to win by a few seconds. And I would think Lutzenberger at this stage of the game starting to tire a little bit. But he's a man we're going to see an awful lot more of in the future and hopefully alongside his teammate Marco Pantani, who's not in this year's Tour de France, and if he had been, I think the two of them could have been a great duo in the mountain stages. And there's Neil Stevens. We just caught a glimpse of him. He is now being collected by the Rominger group, who are sweeping up everybody from that original break of some 14, 15 men. And look at this, there's more trouble. Indurain has been tailed now by the Rominger group and is losing further ground. Well... Miguel Indurain and what should have been the happiest moment of the tour this year for him. He carries number one as the winner five times. He's now being dropped again on this long climb. He must know like the back of his hand. Well, he's one of the few men that could know this because he's been down to look at this part of the Pyrenees. He's not very far from home and he may well have used his climb in training, but this year has not been Miguel Indurain's year, you know. I saw the performances he put in in the Dauphiné and I thought this year Indurain again is going to be invincible and it may well be that he came to form just a little bit too soon. Indurain shakes his head a little bit. The crowd recognised their hero, but the hero this time is behind a lot of riders in the Tour de France. Uh, four minutes, five seconds to the group in front. We can add on another ten seconds to Miguel here. This great champion who has entertained us, winning this race for five years straight. Now he's going to have to dig very, very deep on his courage to just finish this Tour de France, I think. 
it's going to be very hard because it's so difficult for him now to suffer, I think. He realizes he doesn't have the yellow tunic on his shoulders that he's had over the last five years, and it, that has been able to force him a little bit further than he could normally go on these mountains, but for the moment, he's riding for 10th place, and 10th place to Miguel Indurain doesn't mean quite so much, and I don't think he can force himself to suffer. He seems to be looking at the crowd and giving them a slight shake of his head as if to say, I'm sorry, it's not there. And as always, the photographers are there to record the moment. They were there to record the moment when he won the tour. As so often in the mountains in the time trials, now those same people there to record the day he lost his sixth tour straight. There's the view from the helicopter, the massive, massive crowd down there. And the vast majority had hoped to see the rebirth of Miguel. Eight riders surviving together. This really has become a case of survival. You can see just at the back there, in fact, Lutenberger was suffering, but this man here at the moment has got his lowest possible gear in just to try and survive and get over the top of this mountain. Miguel Indurain is laboring all over his bicycle. He doesn't seem to be able to get the power from anywhere at all. All he can try and hope now is he can just keep those legs ticking over to survive over the top of this climb, the last major climb of this year's Tour de France. It's a horrible feeling indeed when you know there are no more gears left to go down to when you're on top of your form, of course, you're going up them, not down them, and you do your best to destroy your rivals by a demonstration of pure strength. Big Mig has known all about that, but I wonder how much he's known about this. The spectators stay loyal to the man who has entertained them for five years as winner. They take the turn to run alongside him and give him a word of encouragement. They will probably feel as sorry about this as Miguel himself, and I'm quite sure that Miguel Indurain will feel he's letting the people down, but he shouldn't. Joined to decide now are Massimiliano Lelli, an Italian rider. And Lelli too will be wondering how on earth he's come to catch Miguel Indurain on the steepest climb of the day. The Bass flags wave. The drinks are proffered and not accepted. The climb continues. The cheers are now for Escartan, the rider in the green shorts, as the yellow jersey assumes control at the front of the breakaway. The road's very, very narrow here. There's a little bit of a crash at the back of this group there. Somebody, in fact, touched wheels there. Looks very much to me Amber as if Inc. that was Laurent, F Laurent Dufault, in fact, was at the back. And I think he must have touched the wheel, perhaps, of Varenk, who's jumped off and readjusted it, but straight back in. Bit of a sad time for Varenk because he's coming close to the sprint. He wanted the maximum points at the top of his all-category climb, which are the highest points of the tour, and he's quickly accelerating with Dufault. Oh, what a teammate there. Dufault dropped back to make sure everything was OK. In fact, I think they actually rode into each other on that little bit of an, an um, incident there. But... Looks to me as if uh, Varenk's going to go right round the outside. He has to go to the front now to try and get some points in the King of the Mountains competition because that's what his aim is in this year's tour, to walk away with that polka dot jersey. But that just goes to show how quickly things can change. Well, the way he shoved that spectator out of the way, it may have been the spectators who actually caused the ricochet that caused the fall. But either way, he's got right back in there. And you see the acceleration of Richard Varenk. Let's have a look now what happened. It was the spectators, I think, Yes, and that was, the, that was actually the situation as he was trying to get back to the front with the spectators getting in the way. So a thick here for the spectator, and now on the front is Richard Varenk. He's got back where he wants to be, and look at this, 4.40 now on the climb here between the Alano and Indurain group, and just look at all these people on this mountain. Even at this height, it is very, very hot indeed today. And it looks as though Varenk is going to get the maximum points on top of the climb, which is what he wants. Or is he? Peter Rugamov is going to annoy him. And Varenk is going to show him what acceleration is all about, because this man is an excellent climber. He's developed over these past three years, and he's made this competition his again. The last man to do this, by the way, was a Spaniard, Jimenez, Julio Jimenez, and who did the triple back in the 60s. So maximum points uh, for the polka dot jersey were over the top of the climb as they now ease up. They're in no hurry today. All the men that matter are around them here. They know that Indrain, Olano, Rominger, almost five minutes behind. So we'll take a break.
The first Spanish rider to get onto the podium in the Tour was Bernardo Ruiz, who was third in 1952. And look at the men who've done better coming up. This is the most hazardous terrain on Earth. The first Spaniard to get the winner's kiss was Federico Bajamontes in 1959. Although in the days before VIP enclosures, he had to brave the barbed wire to get it. It was another 14 years before Spain won again with Luis Ocaña in 1973. And 15 after that to Pedro Delgado in 1988. After him though, it was only a two year wait until his one time lieutenant took command of the race for the next five years. Well, thanks, Gary, but I'm afraid the reign of the king is over because he's a long, long way behind now as we are shortly coming into the outskirts of Pamplona. The riders have just passed under the 10-kilometre-to-go uh, banner and we're now looking at uh, Bjorn Aris. Bjorn Aris, the rider who has really spearheaded this breakaway today with the help of his teammate Jan Ulrich and in the breakaway, Richard Varenk, Laurent Dufault, the man who is going to have to try and win the stage now for Spain, Fernando Escartin. And he's here in the green strip when you spot him, Peter Lutenberger coming through here. The great Austrian hope, but we're out of the Pyrenees now. He still hasn't had his stage win. This is Laurent Dufault, the Swiss rider having a marvellous Tour de France. All of these riders making big gains today in the overall classification. Here's the star now from Berlin, Jan Ulrich. A German rider who has shown us this year he will win a Tour de France and it won't be too far away. Riding up to second overall now, Jan Ulrich, with the absence from this group of Abraham Olano and Tony Rominger. And what was the last time check on that group for? Six minutes and 40 seconds, and then almost 20 minutes behind was the gap there to Evgeny Berzin's group, which is a gap of around about 30 riders. So the main field, as we said earlier, could well be nearly one hour behind. An awful long way, and I think uh, the group we call the Autobus, that's the group where all of the riders who have been dropped try to get on board and just come in together because they know that the organisation can't eliminate more than a quarter of the field on any one day, and because of that, it's uh, safety in numbers back there. Well, Reese has clearly demonstrated again his strength today. He's had complete control of this breakaway. If they ever got a little bit frisky, he would go to the front and turn up the pace a bit, and that would remind them uh, that he was the best man in this race, as he certainly is. There's no doubt about that. And Laurent Dufault flexing his legs there, a man we should watch out for. And Laurent Dufault, oh, we, we know from the Leeds Classic back in Great Britain, where he finished fifth in that in 1994. And doubtless will be back there again this year with the Festina team the last sprint there of today's stage going through the town of Vilava, the hometown of Miguel Indurain, and that went to Richard Virenk, and Lutenberger went across there in second place. Only just small prizes for the moment, the big one remained at the end of the stage in front of what is an incredible crowd. And now the riders are slowing down, a little bit of cat and mouse developing perhaps. They've got huge time gains, but of course Ulrich doesn't want it to slow too much, otherwise he's going to hand back uh, his second place to Abraham Olano and or Tony Rominger back in that second group. But seven minutes, eight seconds now, well, he's got a little bit of time in hand. It can only be around about four kilometres to go now. We'd like to get down there and see the banners, but you see, as we do go, there is the four-kilometre banner. And it won't be long, I don't think, before the tactic comes from Bjarne Aris and Jan Ulrich. I think he'll start to pick the tempo up a little bit just to make sure that none of these other riders in the breakaway can try and jump clear and steal the victory, because I do feel sure that Jan Ulrich is setting himself up for the stage victory today, and he would definitely deserve it. Well, take note of Laurent Dufault sitting here at the back of this group. He seems to have eased off the pressures. There's no such easing off by the yellow jersey of this race. He is riding this race like the champion. Once you pull on the golden fleece, I think you really do become two men. But you see Jan Ulrich is so strong, he doesn't want anybody to slow down this breakaway, even though they're less than four kilometres from the finish. Whenever they do, he goes through and he opens up a gap of two or three metres. He's put an awful lot of energy into the success of this breakaway today. 
We shall be but there's the attack we really expected. It is coming from Pyotr Ugamov, but I think they spotted it. He sat down, but the reaction has come. And Dufault, who's sitting at the back, is the first one to shoot through and catch up with Pyotr Ugamov. That was a very predictable move, and the, the, the man who really is a climber made it look a bit obvious. Well, Dufo went straight onto that. He was waiting for somebody to come from that small group of eight riders, and that is the only way these climbers can try and outwit the power, I think, of Jan Ulrich and Bjarne Ries, because that is the, the best way for them to go, but it's too far out trying to attack with three kilometres to go. They want to try near the kilometre flag if they're going to try and surprise them, and again, Ulrich comes to the front, starts setting the tempo. Bjarne Ries sitting at the back a little bit just to keep an eye on affairs. But look at this, Bjarne Ries is coming up and he's winding up. He's looking at them and he's going. Ries is going to hit them again. He hit them yesterday on the climb to Hotakam and now he's going to try and rip them all apart on the longest stage of this year's Tour de France because Bjarne Ries is determined to stamp his name all over this year's event. He's tempted them all out. He almost said, come and join me, and they have. Well, that was pretty painful, I can tell you, those guys there. An attack now coming from Luttenberger, straight down the left-hand side. Ulrich goes with him and nearly takes out Ugramov there as well, but that was a good marking there by Jan Ulrich. He was waiting for the counter-attack to come, and it will all come back together. So that may be why Robert Bjarne Ries attacked, because he wanted to provide a platform there for Jan Ulrich to launch an attack. And now they're all having a go now, as Ugramov has gone again. Ugramov has gone again, Dufault is chasing him. What a great move there by Bjarne Ries. He actually let the gap go. He swung across there so that his teammate could go away with Piotr Ugramov, because if these two or three riders can go clear, then the victory must then go to Jan Ulrich. But still, Escartin, the only Spanish rider in the group there, tries to close it down as we really are in the streets of Pamplona. And it's a fine approach to the finishing line as well. The riders kept on one side of a dual carriageway all the way down through this very, very beautiful city. But they're all waiting for the move, they're all watching each other, and they're all back together again now as we're coming down to the last couple of kilometres of this race. Oh. Ugramov, I think they're going to let him fry now, Paul. Bjarne Ries went to the back there. I was worried when he went to the back on Hotakam yesterday because I thought it was a moment of weakness. But the man is just so strong. He can sit at the back of the group and survey exactly what is going on, which is what he's doing right now as Virenk tries a little dummy attack down the left-hand side. Now they go again. Ries has gone again. Ries has launched another attack up on the inside. So Ulrich's turn to wait now. This is a two riders have gone like ferrets out of the front of this group. Just look at the gap they formed this time, and I think it's uh, Dufault who's gone with him. Dufault is going to sit there and hold him, and I think Reese waded through. Dufault is going to go through. He takes a look at Reese as he goes over the top of Bjorn Reese. The Swiss rider now has the gap. Laurent Dufault, he's only been a pro barely five years. He finished 19th in the Tour de France last year. 43rd in the Tour of Italy, and now they're both clear and working together. And the yellow jersey has got the advantage again. There'll be no reaction from Ulrich. It's going to have to come from Escartin, I think. But that gap has opened up so rapidly. These two men have decided to work well together at the front. They won't have very much further to go. If they can open up 100 metres, then the winner has got to come from this two rides, and I think it will do now as they go under the one-kilometre banner. So Laurent Dufault, the rider who is having a great tour, and he finished 20th in the World Championships a couple of years ago. He's one of those rides that hangs near the good results but never gets them. Now he has got himself onto the back wheel of the Mayo Journal of the Tour de France. He's been watching for this move. Everybody who has attacked, Laurent Dufault has gone with them. He seems to have the strength to work with Bjorn Aris. Ries looks over his shoulder there, just as a check to see exactly where everybody else is. It's a shame, though, for Jan Ulrich, because he's done so much work. I thought he would have been the man, but he's going to go down to a two-man sprint here. Ries takes the front line, and Dufo's perfectly placed in his wheel. So as they come into the straight in Pamplona, no Miguel Indurain in the yellow jersey, but it's a yellow jersey who looks up towards the finish again now. In at the kill of another tough stage of the Tour de France, Bjorn Ries is the man this year. He's going to lead out Laurent Dufault. He may not have the legs to hold him off. Dufault is itching to get a go at the finishing line today. He's come close on a number of stages. Now he grits his teeth. The head down of Bjorn Ries. That won't be enough. Laurent Dufault gets the stage. Bjorn Ries is second. A great result for Switzerland, an even better result for the Mayo Jean. Now the battle for third place as Ulrich here takes the wheel of Richard Varenk. Escar team would like to give something to Spain here. He's in the middle in green, but now look at the speed of Ulrich. And Ulrich easily, not no, Ulrich won't get beaten. Varenk uh, gets it. Ulrich is just behind him, and the rest of the riders come over the line. 
So Richard Varenk will find himself third overall tonight, as well as being third on the stage. There's the face of Bjorn Lloris, but what he did in the end was give a perfect lead out to Laurent Dufault, and Dufault gets the stage win. So the order over the line was Laurent Dufault, Bjorn Lloris, and Richard Varenk. And there he is, the breakaway has been in more than seven minutes. Indurain has been out in the saddle more than seven hours today. If he wins this sprint, he can only hope for a ninth place finish. But as he comes up to the line here, a rider there taps him on the shoulder and consoles Miguel Indurain. But you can hear the crowd, all of the cheers here are for this one man, this great winner of five Tours de France. He never dreamt this would happen to him today. As he comes over the line, Indurain wants no part of the finish. He's a man who seems to know when he's beaten. And confirmation of the result, a win for Laurent Dufault of the Festina team. He got there in seven hours, seven minutes and eight seconds. Bjorn Reese was second in the same time. 20 seconds later, Richard Varenk takes third place. Neil Stevens of Australia, the early breakaway hero over the mountains, he finished 11th. Tony Rominger was 12th and Miguel Indurain only 19th. Today was also a horror story for Evgeny Berzin. He lost 33 minutes and in two days has fallen from second to obscurity. Chris Boardman finished 45 minutes behind today, but he was safely in a group despite a minor fall, and Gary Imlach was waiting for him. Like a nightmare. Went on about just as long as well. <laughs> what happened there? <laughs> Fell off. When, we, when was that? We, we didn't really see you. Oh, when I was uh, in the group ahead. Um, just the same, same problem I've had since the start. It's very tiring, isn't Same it? problem I've had since the start of the tour. Just uh, nothing there. We had a max pulse of 151 today. I was riding at 147 most of the day. Just like a complete nightmare, and it went on just as long over eight hours. You'd said it was going to be the hardest stage. Was it better or worse than you'd expected all along? It was uh, the worst thing I've ever done on a bike. It's, um, I want to put it melodramatically. I didn't, I didn't beat the tour, but the tour didn't beat me today. Major changes overall tonight. Bjorn Aris still leads, of course, but his teammate Jan Ulrich is now up from fourth to second. Richard Varenk comes up to third. Abraham Olano is down from second to ninth, and Tony Rominger from third to tenth. Miguel Indurain, well, he now looks at a double-figure deficit. And Chris Borman also felt the full force of this tour today. He now slips to 41st. But this day could not pass without Pamplona being given the opportunity to welcome the man who has given them so much pleasure since 1991. Miguel Indurain was called to the podium, and then Bjorn Aris returned to give him the flowers in a poignant moment of respect for the five-time tour winner. Then Reese took one step back, and applauded one of the greatest bike riders this sport has ever known. Emotional scenes in Pamplona this evening, Miguel Indurain no longer the king of a Tour de France. Well, tomorrow the race returns back over the Pyrenees. It'll be another tough day for all of them. Enjoy it with us tomorrow night at 6.30. Until then, from Pamplona, goodbye.